On September 11, 2001, 19 terrorists who were members of Al-Qaeda, an Islamic extremist network, hijacked four commercial airplanes. In a coordinated attack, the hijackers intentionally flew two of the airplanes into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and a third into the Pentagon. Learning about the other hijackings, passengers and crew members on the fourth plane launched a counterattack, spurring the hijacker pilot to crash the plane into a field in Pennsylvania. Nearly 3,000 people were killed that day, the single largest loss of life resulting from a foreign attack on American soil. The following is a narrated timeline of events that occurred on 9-11. Listener discretion is advised. On the morning of 9-11, a total of 19 terrorists will hijack four California-bound commercial airplanes shortly after their departures from airports in Boston, Massachusetts, Newark, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Before 9-11, Airports were not required to videotape security checkpoints. At that time, knives were allowed on planes if the blade was less than four inches in length. 7.59 a.m. Flight 11 takes off. American Airlines Flight 11 takes off from Boston. 11 crew members, 76 passengers, and five hijackers are on board. The aircraft is filled with 76,400 pounds of fuel for its transcontinental flight to Los Angeles. 8.15 a.m. Flight 175 takes off. United Airlines Flight 175 takes off from Boston for Los Angeles. Nine crew members, 51 passengers, and five hijackers are on board. The flight is loaded with 76,000 pounds of fuel. 8.19 a.m. Flight 11 crew members contact ground personnel. Flight attendant Betty Ann Ong alerts American Airlines ground personnel to a hijacking underway on Flight 11, reporting that the cockpit is unreachable. My name is Betty Ong. I'm number three on Flight 11. Okay. Using an in-flight phone, Ong transmits detailed information about the hijacking on the call, which lasts about 25 minutes. We just left Boston, we're up in the air, we're supposed to go to L.A., and the cockpit's not answering their phone. Shortly before Ong's call, a hijacker, likely Satam al sukami had stabbed the passenger seated directly in front of him in first class. The cockpit's not answering Please? I don't know, I think we're getting hijacked. Hijackers Muhammad Atta and Abdul Aziz Alamari are seated in the close proximity as well. The passenger, identified as Daniel M. Lewin by the flight crew, had served four years in the Israeli army. The final report of the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States speculates that he may have tried to stop the hijackers. Lewin was likely the first person killed in the 9-11 attacks. At 8.21 a.m., two minutes into Ong's call, the hijackers turn off the plane's transponder a device that allows air traffic control to identify and monitor an airplane's flight path. The American 106 and Executive 956, we just lost a target on that aircraft. United 1523, did you hear your company, uh, did you hear uh, some interference on the frequency here uh, a couple of minutes ago, screaming? Yes, I did, 797, and uh, I, we couldn't tell what it was either. Okay. Meanwhile, American Airlines authorities relay details from Ong to their operations center in Texas. Five minutes later, Ong provides the hijackers' seat numbers to American Airlines. After several failed connections, at 8.32 a.m., flight attendant Madeline Amy Sweeney reports the hijacking of Flight 11 to a friend on the ground, a manager of Boston Logan International Airport. Over the course of approximately 12 minutes, Sweeney provides key information about the hijacking, including a description of the perpetrators. 
8.20 a.m. Flight 77 takes off. American Airlines Flight 77, en route to Los Angeles, takes off from Washington Dulles International Airport. Six crew members, 53 passengers, and five hijackers are on board. The flight is loaded with 49,900 pounds of fuel. 8.24 a.m. Flight 11 hijacker transmits a message. Attempting to communicate with passengers and crew inside Flight 11's cabin, hijacker Mohammed Atta presses the wrong button, broadcasting instead to air traffic control and unwittingly alerting controllers to the attacks. We have some planes. Just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are turning to the airport. Nobody moves. Everything is okay. If you try to make any moves, you'll injure yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. Minutes later, Atta again makes an unintended transmission to ground control. Nobody moves, please. We are going back to the airport. Don't try to make any stupid moves. At least one of Atta's transmissions is picked up by the pilot of Flight 175, Victor J. Saracini, who will inform the Federal Aviation Administration of what he has heard before his own plane is hijacked. 8.30 a.m. The World Trade Center comes to life. Morning activities have commenced at the World Trade Center, a commercial building complex in Lower Manhattan owned by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, an interstate agency. In addition to the signature Twin Towers, 1 and 2 World Trade Center, the complex included a hotel, 3 World Trade Center, 4 office buildings, 4, 5, 6, and 7 World Trade Center, a shopping mall, restaurants, a public plaza, and a major transportation hub. 8.42 a.m. Flight 93 takes off. Scheduled to leave Newark International Airport within minutes of the other hijacked flights, United Airlines Flight 93 takes off after a delay due to routine traffic. Seven crew members, 33 passengers, and four hijackers are on board the San Francisco-bound flight, which is filled with 48,700 pounds of fuel. 8.46 a.m. North Tower Attack Five hijackers crash on American Airlines Flight 11 into floors 93 through 99 of One World Trade Center, the North Tower. Uh, Pat, we are just currently getting a look at the World Trade Center. We have something that has happened here at the World Trade Center. The we 76 passengers and 11 crew members on board and hundreds inside the building are killed instantly. Just coming up on uh, this scene, this is easily three quarters of the way up. Uh, we are, uh, this has, whatever has occurred has just occurred. The crash severs all three emergency stairwells and traps hundreds of people above the 91st floor. We had seen a fireball, and I can tell you it appears as though something has gone into the World Trade Center. But there now appears to be smoke pouring out of the gash of the north side of the World Trade Center. My heaven. 8.46 a.m. First responders mobilize, and North Tower evacuation begins. New York City emergency dispatchers send police, paramedics, and firefighters to the North Tower. Immediately after witnessing the crash from 14 blocks north of the World Trade Center, Battalion Chief Joseph Pfeiffer directs New York City Fire Department dispatch to issue a second alarm. We just had a, a plane crash into level four of the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center, the tower number one, is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just sent every available ambulance to the World Trade Center now. En route to the scene, he signals a third alarm which calls for 23 engine and ladder companies, 12 chiefs, and 10 specialized units to respond to a plane crash at, quote, box 8087, end quote, the FDNY's shorthand reference for the World Trade Center. 
Vehicle drivers are instructed to park adjacent to the North Tower. I'm just about 15 blocks north of the World Trade Center right now on 7th Avenue. Fire trucks are screaming down 7th Avenue trying to get to this fire. It looks like the fire is about 10 blocks from the, t I mean, excuse me, 10 stories from the top of the building. Flames are shooting out. P smoke is pouring out. This gash goes from one side of the building practically all the way to the other. You can see thick black smoke pouring out of the front of the building, the north side. I can also see it coming out of the west side, and it's certainly coming off the entire top of the building right now. The Port Authority Police Department, or PAPD, is responsible for the safety and security of the World Trade Center, in addition to regional bridges, tunnels, airports, and the Port of New York and New Jersey. They mobilized in response to the attack. Additional PAPD units from other posts dispatched to the World Trade Center to aid in the evacuation and rescue. 8.59 a.m. Port Authority Police Department orders the evacuation of Twin Towers, and moments later, the entire World Trade Complex. Then the firefighters started to come up, and they would holler, move to the right, move to the right. I think it was probably about the 40th floor when the firefighters started coming up, and I remember thinking, they're, they're going to climb all the way up to 80? I mean, how, how are they going to do that? A few people clapped, a few people wished them, you know, blessings, God blessings, and uh, a few people patted them on the shoulders. Come, people shouted out to go to the 65th floor where there's a handicapped person or to, giving them information, and they just were stone-faced, just st looked straight ahead. They really didn't show much emotion. I couldn't imagine these firefighters going up there and to God knows what. There were three flows of people, the regular people like me going down, the people who were coming down from the upper floors and who were very badly burned, no skin, no, no hair, just burned. And they were walking or carried down by people, helped by people. Screams were coming down from the stairwell, emergency, emergency. And then the third flow of people was, of course, those the security personnel and fire department people. Now, those people were exhausted. In some of those um, eyes, they knew something. That it was dangerous. They knew something. Well, there was no panic whatsoever in the stairwell. Those people were concentrated, focused on doing that job. And while I was walking down, they were going up to their death. And I was walking down to live. 9 a.m. On board Flight 175. Earlier, at 8.52 a.m., a flight attendant, likely Robert John Fangman, had reached United Airlines operator in San Francisco, California, and reported a hijacking underway. By 9 a.m., passengers Garnett Ace Bailey, Peter Burton Hansen, and Brian David Sweeney had called family members. Message one. Jules, this is Ryan. Uh, listen, on an airplane, that's been hijacked. Things will go well. I'm looking good. I just want you to know I absolutely love you. I want you to do good. So happy to time. Uh, same to my parents and everybody. And I just totally love you. And uh, I'll see you later. Hi, babe. Hope I call you. Three minutes later, at 9.03 a.m., South Tower attack. Three sides of tower number one, and that is the only building It's exploding effect. right now, Tommy. We're seeing another, that was, no, another apparently plane. Apparently, that was another plane. We have a witness who we just spoke to a moment ago. We're hearing from Carl Tendler, who was at the Village Apartments in Washington Square. We're trying to bring him on the air. All right, that Carl. was a second plane uh, that just blew? number one. It's been another one, Carl. Yes, he hit in building number one. The other building. Yes, he flew right into it. Five hijackers crashed United Airlines Flight 175 into floor 77 through 85 of Two World Trade Center, the South Tower, killing the 51 passengers and nine crew members on board the aircraft and an unknown number of people inside the building. The impact renders two of the three emergency stairwells impassable and severs a majority of the elevator cables in this area, trapping many above the impact zone and inside elevator cars. Shortly after hijacked Flight 175 strikes the South Tower, some workers in the building jump or fall to their deaths, 
a phenomenon already witnessed after the attack on the North Tower. Another plane hit the other building. Oh, another one hit another building. Oh, listen, I, I know. I'm, I'm here. Jump out the window. I'm okay. I'm okay. Another plane. Another plane. Did you yeah, I heard it. The other one. The other train set. The other building. Estimates of the number of people who die as a result from falling from the Twin Towers range from 50 to more than 200. 9.03 a.m. Increasing response. In addition to requesting the shutdown of airspace over New York City, the New York City Police Department, or NYPD, calls for a second level for mobilization bringing its total deployment to nearly 2,000 officers. The New York City Fire Department issues a fifth alarm for the South Tower, deploying several hundred additional firefighters to the disaster. Additional companies and off-duty personnel from across the metropolitan area travel to the scene. 9.12 a.m. On board Flight 77. Flight attendant Renee A. May calls her mother, Nancy May, and tells her that hijackers have seized control of the plane, forcing passengers and crew members to the rear of the aircraft. When they disconnected, Nancy May calls American Airlines. Minutes later, Flight 77 passenger Barbara K. Olson calls her husband, U.S. Solicitor General Theodore Olson, who is at his desk in the Department of Justice. She tells him that hijackers have taken over the flight using knives and box cutters. Theodore Olson alerts other federal agencies. 9.37 a.m. Attack at the Pentagon. crash American Airlines Flight 77 into the Pentagon. The 53 passengers and six crew members on board perish. The crash and ensuing fire kill 125 military and civilian personnel on the ground. They asked me if I knew what was going on in New York. So I said no, and she said, well, you've got to come see. And there's a crowd of people watching the TV. So I stood there for a few minutes and watched. And then I walked back to my desk. I called my wife. She said she knew, and I said, well, I just wanted to let you know I was okay. And she said, do me a favor. For the rest of the day, work from underneath your desk. So I laughed. And I said, yeah, honey, I will. I love you, and I'll see you tonight. And I walked back over, and by this time, the crowd kind of thinned out a little bit. And just as I decided to get up and leave, the plane hit the outside of the building. I was blown through the air, and... When I landed, I really didn't know where I was. That kind of scared me because I knew the floor plan of our space better than I knew the floor plan of my own house. The room was just black, and everything I touched burned my hands. I just started crawling on my hands and knees, and I knew I was going in the right direction when it started getting a little bit lighter, and I could feel water on my back from the sprinklers. Eventually I stood up and started walking down towards the center courtyard. And it's at this point that I finally realized how badly I was hurt because as I was walking, I looked down at my hands and I remember seeing just strings of skin which was hanging off my hands from the burns. 9.58 a.m. 911 call from Flight 93. 37 telephone calls are known to have been made from hijacked Flight 93, most placed from the rear of the airplane. Mark, this is your mom. It's 10.54 a.m. The news is that it's been hijacked by terrorists. They are planning to probably use the plane as a target to hit some site on the ground. So if you possibly can, try to overpower these guys if you can because uh, they'll probably use the plane as a target. So uh, I, I would say go ahead and do everything you can to overpower them because they're hell-bent. Uh, uh, I'll uh, try, to, try to call me back if you can. Uh, you know the number here. 
Okay, I love you, sweetie. Bye. Mark, apparently it's terrorists and they're hell-bent on crashing the aircraft, so if you can, try to take over the aircraft. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be much plan to land, uh, land the aircraft normally, so I guess your best bet would be to try to take it over if you, if you can, or tell the other passengers. There's one flight that they say is headed toward San Francisco. It, it might be yours. Uh, uh, so if you can, group some people and perhaps do the best you can to, to get control of it. Uh, I love you, sweetie. Good luck. Bye-bye. One of the last calls is made by passenger Edward P. Felt, who uses his cell phone to dial 911 after closing himself in the restroom to avoid detection. By 9.58 a.m., Flight 93 is flying so low that he succeeds in reaching an emergency operator in nearby Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania. 9.59 a.m. Collapse of the South Tower. And you can see the two towers, a huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. After burning for 56 minutes, the South Tower collapses in less than 10 seconds. More than 800 civilians and first responders inside the building and in the surrounding area are killed as a result of the attack on the South Tower. I could hear these sounds, this sort of cracking, loud cracking, and it collapsed. I remember my hair lifting from the wind at a sound was like 30,000 jets taking off. We're going down the stairways. The lights flickered. This, this tremendous roar. And the, the stairway shook. It was like being, I've never been in an earthquake, but I can imagine that's what it's like. And that building was down. And we're holding on to the, banister and the building is shaking and no one said a word. It was silence until the noise had stopped. 10.03 a.m. Crash of Flight 93. We're making a turn at 9.56. He appears to be heading right towards us. American 10.60, do you see anybody northwest of you? Can you see back that far there? Uh, we're looking now, sir. United 93, Cleveland, do you still hear the center? Uh, we did, but we lost them in the turn. You can make a turn back to a 220 heading. Let me know if you can see them. United 93, do you still hear Cleveland? United 93, United 93, do you hear Cleveland? Thank you. Thank you. United 93, United 93, do you hear Cleveland? United 93, United 93, Cleveland. United 93, United 93, do you hear Cleveland Center? Do you see any uh, activity on your right side, smoke or anything like that? Four hijackers crash Flight 93 in a field near the town of Shanksville in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, after passengers and crew stormed the cockpit. The 33 passengers and seven crew members on board perish. The crash site is approximately 20 minutes flying time from Washington, D.C. 10.28 a.m. Collapse of the North Tower. collapses after burning for 102 minutes. More than 1,600 people are killed as the result 
of the attack on the North Tower. It was probably a half hour later that I heard the same rumblings coming down, and that was from the North Tower. I said, oh, geez, here we go again. I said, you know, what's the chances of me surviving the second collapse? I don't know. Not too good. I wanted to run like hell myself down the stairwell that I was sending all those people down. But unfortunately, I said, I can't run that fast. This thing is going to beat me out. So what I did was I made it down about three or four stairs, and it was a, a little bit of a landing that was there. And I just basically positioned myself there with a couple of the other guys. I said, guys, grab the wall. You know, we're going to do the same thing we did for the first collapse, and I'm sure that we're going to make it. You know, we're going to be fine. So we grabbed the wall again, and but this time it seemed like the collapse lasted forever. The whole ground was shaking. Nothing was on fire by me, but still the, the blinding smoke. But I was at the base of the smoke. I couldn't run anywhere. The smoke was all around me and all the debris and the, uh, the, cloud, the cloud of dust. It wasn't really so much smoke, but it was the dust cloud that was coming down. It was choking. It really was. I was like, oh my God, it was the closest uh, to dying that I ever thought about. 11.02 a.m. New York City Mayor orders evacuation of Lower Manhattan. Near the World Trade Center, when the South Tower collapses, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani and senior members of his administration find temporary shelter inside an office building close by. As the dust begins to settle, they walk north, intent on establishing a new base of operations for city government. Reporters catch up with the mayor, who urges the public at 11.02 a.m. to evacuate Lower Manhattan. He will continue to address the public in briefings at temporary headquarters at the New York City Police Academy throughout the day. Afternoon. Rescue efforts continue at the World Trade Center site. Within hours of the attacks, some rescue workers and journalists begin referring to the scene of mass destruction at the World Trade Center site as Ground Zero, a term typically used to describe devastation caused by an atomic bomb. First responders, search and rescue teams, and volunteers continue to converge on Ground Zero throughout the day. Rescuers use special tools to peer into voids and search for remnants of stairwells and elevators that might shelter survivors. The last successful rescue will occur midday on September 12th. 8.30 p.m. The United States President addresses the nation from the White House. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. President George W. Bush said, quote, the search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and bring them to justice. We, we will, will make, make no, no distinction, distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. The global war on terror begins. October 7th, 2001. Airstrikes by the United States and Great Britain are launched in Afghanistan at Taliban and Al-Qaeda training camps and targets. Quote, What America is tasting now is only a copy of what we have tasted. End quote. Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden says in a video statement released the same day. Quote, Our Islamic nation has been tasting the same for more than 80 years of humiliation and disgrace. Its sons killed and their blood spilled, its sanctities desecrated." End quote. October 19th through 20th, 2001. The ground war begins with special forces striking in southern Afghanistan. In the coming weeks, Britain, Turkey, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, France, and Poland all announce they will deploy troops to Afghanistan. March 19th, 2003. U.S. and coalition forces invade Iraq following intelligence that the country and its dictator, Saddam Hussein, possessed or were developing weapons of mass destruction. The Cost of War Operation Iraqi Freedom 4,431 American deaths Operation New Dawn 74 American deaths 
Operation Enduring Freedom, 2,353 American deaths. Operation Inherent Resolve, 99 American deaths. Operation Freedom Sentinel, 95 American deaths. Brave Americans served strangers on 9-11-2001. Brave Americans have fought the enemies of our nation since then in foreign lands to protect the homeland. There is bravery in all of us. There is bravery and power in you. When we remember 9-11, we should all be reminded to practice kindness, compassion, and bravery. We should remember that first responders and military service members volunteer to protect us from acts of terrorism. We should remember that when bad things happen, we as Americans can come together and help each other. The events of 9-11 brought us together. Many brave men and women have fought in places like Iraq and Afghanistan since then, but they constitute a tiny minority of our nation's populace. A lot of them are still fighting in that war. As you listen to this, remember that. We hope you do something special today to honor 9-11. Go for a walk, a ruck, a run, or a hike. Talk to your friends and family about 9-11, and maybe even profess some gratitude to those who volunteered to help protect us as citizens. It is important to come together today, on September 11th, just like we did on September 11th, 2001. We can unite together as a nation. We can do something meaningful, something positive, and something brave. Thanks for listening and learning about 9-11 with me. Go lead, go learn, and go inspire.